let the object of our education be to open it out before us and to give us the power to make the true use of it in our life and offer it to the rest of the world when the time comes as our contribution to its eternal welfare. I had been immersed in literary activities when this thought struck my mind with painful intensity. I suddenly felt like one groaning under the suffocation of nightmare. It was not only my own soul, but the soul of my country that seemed to be struggling for its breath through me. I felt clearly that what was needed was not any particular material object, not wealth or comfort or power but our awakening to full consciousness in soul freedom, the freedom of the life in God, where we have no enmity with those who must fight, no competition with those who must make money, where we are beyond all attacks and above all insults. Fortunately for me, I had a place ready to my hand where I could begin my work. My father, in one of his numerous travels, had selected this lonely spot as the one suitable for his life of communion with God. This place, with a permanent endowment, he dedicated to the use of those who seek peace and seclusion for their meditation and prayer. I had about ten boys with me when I came here and started my new life with no previous experience whatsoever. All round our ashram is a vast open country bare up to the line of the horizon, except for sparsely growing stunted date palms and prickly shrubs struggling with anthills. Below the level of the field there extend numberless mounds and tiny hillocks of red gravel and pebbles of all shapes and colors, intersected by narrow channels of rainwater. Not far away towards the south, near the village can be seen through the intervals of a row of palm trees the gleaming surface of steel-blue water, collected in a hollow of the ground. A road used by the village people for their marketing in the town goes meandering through the lonely fields with its red dust staring in the sun. Travelers coming up this road can see from a distance on the summit of the undulating ground the spire of a temple and the top of a building, indicating the Shanti Niketan Ashram, among its Amalaki groves and its avenue of stately sal trees. And here the school has been growing up for over fifteen years, passing through many changes and often grave crises. Having the evil reputation of a poet, I could with great difficulty win the trust of my countrymen and avoid the suspicion of the bureaucracy that at last I have been able to accomplish it in some measure is owing to my never expecting it, going on in my own way without waiting for outside sympathy, help, or advice. My resources were extremely small, with the burden of a heavy debt upon them. But this poverty itself gave me the full strength of freedom, making me rely upon truth rather than upon materials. Because the growth of this school was the growth of my life, and not that of mere carrying out of my doctrines, its ideals changed with its maturity, like a ripening fruit that not only grows in its bulk and deepens in its color, but undergoes change in the very quality of its inner pulp. I started with the idea that I had a benevolent object to perform. I worked hard but the only satisfaction I had came from keeping count of the amount of sacrifice in money, energy, and time, admiring my own untiring goodness. But the result achieved was of small worth. I went on building system after system and then pulling them down. It merely occupied my time. But at the heart my work remained vacant. I well remember when an old disciple of my father came and said to me, What I see about me is like a wedding hall where nothing is wanting in preparation. Only the bridegroom is absent. The mistake I made was in thinking that my own purpose was the bridegroom. But gradually my heart found its center. It was not in the work, not in my wish, but in truth. 
I sat alone on the upper terrace of the Shanti Nikitan house and gazed out upon the treetops of the Sal Avenue before me. I withdrew my heart from my own schemes and calculations, from my daily struggles, and held it up in silence before the peace and presence that permeated the sky. And gradually my heart was filled. I began to see the world around me through the eyes of my soul. The trees seemed to me like silent hymns rising from the mute heart of the earth, and the shouts and laughter of the boys mingling in the evening sky came before me like trees of living sounds rising up from the depth of human life. I found my message in the sunlight that touched my inner mind and felt a fullness in the sky that spoke to me in the word of her ancient Rishi. Who could ever move and strive and live in this world if the sky were not filled with love? Thus, when I turned back from the struggle to achieve results, from the ambition of doing benefit to others, and came to my own innermost need, when I felt that living one's own life in truth is living the life of all the world, then the unquiet atmosphere of the outward struggle cleared up, and the power of spontaneous creation found its way through the center of all things. Even now, whatever is superficial and futile in the workings of our institution is owing to distrust of the spirit lurking in our mind, to the ineradicable consciousness of our self-importance, to the habit of looking for the cause of our failures outside us, and the endeavor to repair all looseness in our work by tightening the screws of organization. From my experience, I know that where the eagerness to teach others is too strong, especially in the matter of spiritual life, the result becomes meager and mixed with untruth. All the hypocrisy and self-delusion in our religious convictions and practices are the outcome of the goadings of overzealous activities of mentorship. In our spiritual attainment, gaining and giving are the same thing as in a lamp, to light itself is the same as to impart light to others. When a man makes it his profession to preach God to others, then he will raise the dust more than give direction to truth. Teaching of religion can never be imparted in the form of lessons. It is there where there is religion in living. Therefore, the idea of the forest colony of the seekers of God as the true school of spiritual life, holds good even in this age. Religion is not a fractional thing that can be doled out in fixed weekly or daily measures as one among various subjects in the school syllabus. It is the truth of our complete being, the consciousness of our personal relationship with the infinite. It is the true center of gravity of our life. This we can attain during our childhood by daily living in a place where the truth of the spiritual world is not obscured by a crowd of necessities assuming artificial importance, where life is simple, surrounded by fullness of leisure, by ample space and pure air and profound peace of nature, and where men live with a perfect faith in the eternal life before them. But the question will be asked whether I have attained my ideal in this institution. My answer is that the attainment of all our deepest ideals is difficult to measure by outward standards. Its working is not immediately perceptible by results. We have fully admitted the inequalities and varieties of human life in our ashram. We never try to gain some kind of outward uniformity by weeding out the differences of nature and training of our members. Some of us belong to the Brahma Samaj sect, and some to other sects of Hinduism, and some of us are Christians. Because we do not deal with creeds and dogmas of sectarianism, therefore this heterogeneity of our religious beliefs does not present us with any difficulty whatever. This also I know that the feeling of respect for the ideal of this place and the life lived here greatly varies in depth and earnestness among those who have gathered in the ashram. 
I know that our inspiration for a higher life has not risen far above our greed for worldly goods and reputation. Yet I am perfectly certain, and proofs of it are numerous, that the ideal of the ashram is sinking deeper and deeper into our nature every day. The tuning of our life's strings into purer spiritual notes is going on without our being aware of it. Whatever might be our original motive in coming here, the call sounds without ceasing through all our clamor of discords. The call of Shantam, Shiva, Advaita, the all-peace, the all-good, and the one. The sky here seems penetrated with the voice of the infinite, making the peace of its daybreak and stillness of its night profound with meaning, and sending through the white crowds of shiuli flowers in the autumn and malati in the summer, the message of self-dedication in the perfect beauty of worship. It will be difficult for others than Indians to realize all the associations that are grouped round the word ashram, the forest sanctuary, for it blossomed in India like its own lotus, under a sky generous in its sunlight and starry splendor. India's climate has brought to us the invitation of the open air. The language of her mighty rivers is solemn in their chants. The limitless expanse of her plains encircles our homes with the silence of the world beyond. Where the sun rises from the marge of the green earth like an offering of the unseen to the altar of the unknown. And it goes down to the west at the end of the day like a gorgeous ceremony of nature's salutation to the eternal. In India, the shades of the trees are hospitable. The dust of the earth stretches its brown arms to us. The air with its embraces clothes us with warmth. These are the unchanging facts that ever carry their suggestions to our minds. And therefore we feel it is India's mission to realize the truth of the human soul in the supreme soul through its union with the soul of the world. This mission had taken its natural form in the forest schools in the ancient times and it still urges us to seek for the vision of the infinite in all forms of creation, in the human relationships of love, to feel it in the air we breathe, in the light in which we open our eyes, in the water in which we bathe, in the earth on which we live and die. Therefore I know, and I know it from my own experience, that the students and the teachers who have come together in this ashram are daily growing towards the emancipation of their minds into the consciousness of the infinite. Not through any process of teaching or outer discipline, but by the help of an unseen atmosphere of aspiration that surrounds the place and the memory of a devoted soul who lived here in intimate communion with God. I hope I have been able to explain how the conscious purpose that led me to found my school in the ashram gradually lost its independence and grew into unity with the purpose that reigns in this place. In a word, my work found its soul in the spirit of the ashram. But that soul has its outer form, no doubt, which is its aspect of the school. And in the teaching system of this school, I have been trying all these years to carry out my theory of education based upon my experience of children's minds. I believe, as I suggested before, that children have their subconscious mind more active than their conscious intelligence. A vast quantity of the most important of our lessons has been taught to us through this. Experiences of countless generations have been instilled into our nature by its agency, not only without causing us any fatigue, but giving us joy. This subconscious faculty of knowledge is completely one with our life. It is not like a lantern that can be lighted and trimmed from outside, but it is like the light that the glowworm possesses by the exercise of its life processes. Fortunately for me, I was brought up in a family where literature, music, and art had become instinctive. My brothers and cousins lived in the freedom of ideas, 
and most of them had natural artistic powers. Nourished in these surroundings, I began to think early and to dream, and to put my thoughts into expression. In religion and social ideals, our family was free from all convention, being ostracized by society owing to our secession from orthodox beliefs and customs. This made us fearless in our freedom of mind, and we tried experiments in all departments of life. This was the education I had in my early days, freedom and joy in the exercise of my mental and artistic faculties. And because this made my mind fully alive to grow in its natural environment of nutrition, therefore the grinding of the school system became so extremely intolerable to me. I had only this experience of my early life to help me when I started my school. I felt sure that what was most necessary was the breadth of culture and no formal method of teaching. Fortunately for me, Satish Chandra Roy, a young student of great promise, who was getting ready for his B.A. degree, became attached to my school and devoted his life to carry out my idea. He was barely nineteen, but he had a wonderful soul, living in a world of ideas, keenly responsive to all that was beautiful and great in the realm of nature and of human mind. He was a poet who would surely have taken his place among the immortals of world literature if he had been spared to live. But he died when he was twenty, thus offering his service to our school only for the period of one short year. With him, boys never felt that they were confined in the limit of a teaching class. They seemed to have their access to everywhere. They would go with him to the forest when in the spring the sal trees were in full blossom, and he would recite to them his favorite poems, frenzied with excitement. He used to read to them Shakespeare and even Browning, for he was a great lover of Browning, explaining to them in Bengali with his wonderful power of expression, He never had any feeling of distrust for boys' capacity of understanding. He would talk and read to them about whatever was the subject in which he himself was interested. He knew that it was not at all necessary for the boys to understand literally and accurately, but that their minds should be roused, and in this he was always successful. He was not like other teachers, a mere vehicle of textbooks. He made his teaching personal. He himself was the source of it, and therefore it was made of life stuff, easily assimilable by the living human nature. The real reason of his success was his intense interest in life, in ideas, in everything around him, in the boys who came in contact with him. He had his inspiration not through the medium of books, but through the direct communication of his sensitive mind with the world. The seasons had upon him the same effect as they had upon the plants. He seemed to feel in his blood the unseen messages of nature that are always traveling through space, floating in the air, shimmering in the sky, tingling in the roots of the grass under the earth. The literature that he studied had not the least smell of the library about it. He had the power to see ideas before him, as he could see his friends with all the distinctness of form and subtlety of life. Thus, the boys of our school were fortunate enough to be able to receive their lessons from a living teacher and not from textbooks. Have not our books, like most of our necessaries, come between us and our world? We have got into the habit of covering the windows of our minds with their pages, and plasters of book phrases have stuck into our mental skin making it impervious to all, direct touches of truth. A whole world of bookish truths have formed themselves into a strong citadel with rings of walls in which we have taken shelter, secured from the communication of God's creation. Of course, it would be foolish to underrate the advantages of the book, but at the same time, we must admit that the book has its limitations and its dangers. At any rate, during the early period of education, children should come to their lesson of truth 
gifts through natural processes, directly through persons and things. Being convinced of this, I have set all my resources to create an atmosphere of ideas in the ashram. Songs are composed, not specially made to order for juvenile minds. They are songs that a poet writes for his own pleasure. In fact, most of my Gitanjali songs were written here. These, when fresh in their first bloom, are sung to the boys, and they come in crowds to learn them. They sing them in their leisure hour, sitting in groups under the open sky on moonlight nights, in the shadows of the impending rain in July. All my latter-day plays have been written here, and the boys have taken part in their performance. Lyrical dramas have been written for their season festivals. They have ready access to the room where I read to the teachers any new things that I write in prose or in verse. Whatever the subject may be, and this they utilize without the least pressure put upon them, feeling aggrieved when not invited. A few weeks before leaving India, I read to them Browning's drama Luna, translating it into Bengali as I went on. It took me two evenings, but the second meeting was as full as the first one. Those who have witnessed these boys playing their parts in dramatic performances have been struck with their wonderful power as actors. It is because they are never directly trained in the histrionic art. They instinctively enter into the spirit of the plays in which they take part. Though these plays are no mere schoolboy dramas, they require subtle understanding and sympathy. With all the anxiety and hypercritical sensitiveness of an author about the performance of his own play, I have never been disappointed in my boys and I have rarely allowed teachers to interfere with the boys' own representation of the characters. Very often they themselves write plays or improvise them, and we are invited to their performance. They hold meetings of their literary clubs, and they have at least three illustrated magazines conducted by three sections of the school, the most interesting of them being that of the infant section. A number of our boys have shown remarkable powers in drawing and painting, developed not through the orthodox method of copying models, but by following their own bent, and by the help of occasional visits from some artists to inspire the boys with their own work. When I first started my school, my boys had no evident love for music. The consequence is that at the beginning I did not employ a music teacher, and did not force the boys to take music lessons. I merely created opportunities when those of us who had the gift could exercise their musical culture. It had the effect of unconsciously training the ears of the boys. And when gradually most of them showed a strong inclination and love for music, I saw that they would be willing to subject themselves to formal teaching, and it was then that I secured a music teacher. In our school, the boys rise very early in the morning, sometimes before it is light. They attend to the drawing of water for their bath. They make up their beds. They do all those things that tend to cultivate the spirit of self-help. I believe in the hour of meditation, and I set aside fifteen minutes in the morning and fifteen minutes in the evening for that purpose. I insist on this period of meditation, not however, expecting the boys to be hypocrites and to make believe they are meditating. But I do insist that they remain quiet, that they exert the power of self-control, even though, instead of contemplating on God, they may be watching the squirrels running up the trees. Any description of such a school is necessarily inadequate, for the most important element of it is the atmosphere and the fact that it is not a school which is imposed upon the boys by autocratic authorities. I always try to impress upon their minds that it is their own world, upon which their life ought fully and freely to react. In the school administration, they have their place, and in the matter of punishment, we mostly rely upon their own court of justice. In conclusion, I warn my hearers not to carry away with them any false or exaggerated picture of this ashram. When ideas are stated in a paper, 
they appear too simple and complete. But in reality, their manifestation through the materials that are living and varied and ever-changing is not so clear and perfect. We have obstacles in human nature and in outer circumstances. Some of us have a feeble faith in boys' minds as living organisms, and some have the natural propensity of doing good by force. On the other hand, the boys have their different degrees of receptivity, and there are a good number of inevitable failures. Delinquencies make their appearance unexpectedly, making us suspicious as to the efficacy of our own ideals. We pass through dark periods of doubt and reaction. But these conflicts and waverings belong to the true aspects of reality. Living ideals can never be set into a clockwork arrangement giving accurate account of its every second. And those who have firm faith in their idea have to test its truth in discords and failures that are sure to come to tempt them from their path. I, for my part, believe in the principle of life, in the soul of man, more than in methods. I believe that the object of education is the freedom of mind which can only be achieved through the path of freedom though freedom has its risk and responsibility as life itself has. I know it for certain, though most people seem to have forgotten it, that children are living beings, more living than grown-up people, who have built their shells of habit around them. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary for their mental health and development that they should not have mere schools for their lessons but a world whose guiding spirit is personal love. It must be an ashram where men have gathered for the highest end of life, in the peace of nature, where life is not merely meditative, but fully awake in its activities, where boys' minds are not being perpetually drilled into believing that the ideal of the self-idolatry of the nation is the truest ideal for them to accept where they are bidden to realize man's world as God's kingdom, to whose citizenship they have to aspire, where the sunrise and sunset and the silent glory of stars are not daily ignored, where nature's festivities of flowers and fruit have their joyous recognition from man, and where the young and the old, the teacher and the student, sit at the same table to partake of their daily food, and the food of their eternal life.